I just want to give a brief introduction uh, to Gary because I know many of you will already know his work. But for those that don't, Gary's a, an author and a broadcaster who's worked for The Guardian for 23 years, mm. he told us today. Um, and he writes, obviously, regularly for The Guardian, but also for uh, The Nation. Uh, Gary's the author of four books, The Speech, um, the story behind Martin Luther King's dream, Who Are We? Stranger in a Strange Land, and No Place Like Home. And a new book is coming out in November, isn't that right? Um, which is going to focus, I think I'm right in saying, on some of the stuff that Gary's going to talk about uh, tonight, which you'll know, pivot around questions of why stories of, of, of death uh, and murder on American streets often go rarely, uh, often go unreported or they're rarely, rarely told in any significant uh, depth at all. And the title of the book is Another Day in the Death of America and that's going to be published by Faber, All Being Well, in November. So I'd like you to give Gary a, a nice warm welcome as I asked him to come to the podium and deliver his talk for tonight on Black Lives Matters. Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Robert, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. I. Um, <clears throat> I do know Cal Rain a bit because uh, my my brother, who's there, used to s study here, or at least he was enrolled here, and um, uh, uh, and it provides one of my m more entertaining stories about uh, uh, misidentification um, and race, which is I was I was with my brother in Port Rush, I think, uh, for a, a day. And uh, a man came up to us who we didn't know, and he asked my brother if he spoke English. And my brother said, "Yes, I do speak English." And he said, uh, uh, "So you're on holiday?" My brother said, "No, no, no. I'm, I actually live in Coraine." And he said, "Oh, you know, are you working there?" My brother said, "No, I, I study at university." And he said, "What, what, what do you study?" He said, "Biology." And he said, oh, "How's the crack with the biology?" And my brother said, "It's good, thanks. It's good." And, and then the man looked at me. And he turned back to my brother and he said, uh, and what does your lovely wife do? <laughs> and, um, and my brother and I looked at each other, <laughs> kind of uh, stunned, <laughs> silence. And then my brother said to him, usually she's my brother. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then the man was very uh, uh, apologetic and um, it, was all, it was all very funny and a little bit sad. But um, um, so anyway, I'm pleased to be back. Um, I'm still male, uh, for what that's worth. Um, uh, and um, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, Black Lives Matter in the age of Obama. In the film The Matrix, Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne, offers Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, a stark choice. He can either gain a greater understanding of the complex forces that comprise the world in which he lives, or he can continue in a state of imperiled ignorance as though they don't exist. You take the blue pill and the story ends, promises Morpheus. You wake up in your bed and you believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Now, generally speaking, America prefers the blue pill. Most wealthy countries do. In America's case, it starts with a founding myth that the nation was found not on genocide and slavery, but freedom and democracy. And since then, there's been the unrelenting pursuit of progress. Sure, there have been a few bumps in the road, a few hundred years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow, internment of the Japanese, McCarthyism. Some bumps were bigger than others, granted, but the general understanding has been that they were rumbling on in the right direction. When I first went there in 2003, I bought, bought a school history textbook, America's Promise, so I could know what they all know. I know England's myths because I was raised with them. I've seen the way that England eases itself into its murky history like an old man into a cold bath surrounded by its own filth. I know what you have to remember and more importantly, what you have to forget if you want to put the great in Great Britain. I know that power has many parents, but the brutality it takes to acquire it is an orphan. 
That's why so much of black history gets told in the passive voice. India was colonised. Rosa Parks was kicked off the bus. People were denied service at the lunch counter. Things were done, but nobody did them. There was racism, nobody denies that, but apparently no racists. Anyhow, the final chapter of America's Promise ends with this rallying cry. The history of the United States is one of challenges faced, problems resolved, and crises overcome. Throughout their history, Americans have remained an optimistic people, carrying this optimism into the new century. The full promise of America has yet to be realized, and this is the real promise of America, the ability to dream of a better world to come. Such are the assumptions beamed from the torch of Lady Liberty, coursing through the veins of the nation's political culture and imbibed with mother's milk. America, many will tell you, is not just a landmass, but an ideal. A shining city on the hill, beckoning a bright new tomorrow and a dazzling dawn for those who want it badly enough. And almost everyone across races and ethnicities buys into that to some degree. You take the blue pill on that basis, and the story of the last few years that has brought the Black Lives Matter movement into existence can be interpreted in a range of ways. The necessary slaying of unruly street thugs by honorable police officers, a series of incidents in which young people and rattled policemen have produced unfortunate but inevitable outcomes, or even outrageous examples of individual police exercising unnecessary and unlawful force on minority communities. And all these conclusions would qualify for the blue pill for the simple reason that in their various ways they would understand what happened as one-offs. They suggest that the shootings were possibly flawed responses, but essentially isolated incidents, the significance of which doesn't spread beyond their own borders. Glitches in the matrix, but not a challenge to the matrix itself. But take the red pill and you are forced to recognize that there can only be so many isolated incidents before you must establish a pattern. And that the nature of that pattern not only shapes your understanding of those incidents, but frames your ideas about how society operates. In Ways of Seeing, John Berger wrote, the way we see things is affected by what we know and what we believe. The relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. And what's truly unsettling about these high-profile police killings is that they don't contradict what takes place daily in America, but simply illustrate it. What was unsettling was that those who questioned the wisdom of protesters in those moments when the protests turned violent in Ferguson or Baltimore or elsewhere must at least acknowledge that the issue of police killings of black people would not be a nationwide talking point had there been no violence that there would have been no federal investigation into Ferguson by the US Attorney General without those riots. That, to quote the title of the cabinet paper written by the then Conservative Environment Secretary Michael Heseltine about the uprisings in Liverpool and elsewhere in the early 80s, it took a riot. And that if it takes a riot for America to remember the names of children killed by police officers, then that tells you more about the country than it does about the rioters. Indeed, what became clear following the Department of Justice report into the Ferguson police force was just what a state of day-to-day -day tyranny people in that suburb were living under. I'm just going to cite a couple of examples. But between 2007 and 2014, one woman in Ferguson was arrested twice, spent six days in jail, and paid $550 as a result of a single parking ticket for which she originally was charged $151. She tried to pay in smaller installments, 25 or 50 bucks at a time, but the court refused to accept anything less than a full payment, which she could not afford. Seven years after the original infraction, a single parking ticket, she still owed $541. This was how the town of Ferguson raised its revenue. This was not a glitch in the system. This was the system. And then there was the man pulled out of his house by the police after reports of an altercation inside a home. And as they dragged him out, he told them, you don't have an, a reason to lock me up. The officer told him, nigger, I can find something to lock you up on. 
Good luck with that, the man responded, and the officer slammed the man's face into a wall and he fell to the floor. Don't pass out, motherfucker, because I'm not carrying you to my car, the officer is claimed to have said. That last story happened the same month that Michael Brown was killed. And were it not for the disturbances following Brown's death, there would have been no investigation. Not only would we have heard nothing of these incidents, but because no light had been shone on them, the Ferguson police would be carrying on with the same level of impunity. This was a small Midwestern suburb that few had heard of, unremarkable in every way, which is precisely what makes the goings on there noteworthy. Because if it was happening there, it could be happening anywhere. Terror, the anthropologist Arjun Apadurai writes in his book Fear of Small Numbers, is first of all the terror of the next attack. Most African Americans, of course, aren't shot by the police, but few believe that what happened in Ferguson couldn't happen to them. The terrorism resides not just in the fact that it happens, but that one is braced for the possibility that it could happen to you at any moment. The late Maya Angelou told me when I interviewed her in 2002 in reference to September 11th, living in a state of terror was new to many white people in America. But black people have been living in a state of terror in this country for more than 400 years. Evidently, they still are. Um, the book that I'm writing, Another Day in the Death of America, looks at all the children and teens who were shot dead in one day. Um, on average, seven children and teens are shot dead in America every day. On this particular day that I chose at random, 10 kids were killed. And um, one of the main things that jumps out at you when you speak to their parents and uh, uh, other family members is the degree to which, of these 10 kids, seven were black, two Latino, one white. All of the black parents, if you ask them, did you think this might happen? Did you think this was on the cards for your kid? All of them kind of look at you like you must be crazy. And they say, well, of, of course. Of course, this is, these are the things that you worry about. One of the mothers said, well, I didn't think it would be him. I thought it would be his older brother. But the notion that your child might be shot dead is part of being a black parent in urban America, certainly a working class parent. And, uh, and it's simply factored in to your rationale. So most of these parents that I spoke to, the idea of being a successful parent in the context in which they lived, they were good parents for the most part, and attentive and loving and so on, is can you keep your kid out of jail and can you keep them alive until they're 18? That's what you're trying to do. And when I spoke to one dad in Newark, New Jersey, and asked him, did, did you think this could happen to your son? And he said, you wouldn't be doing your job as a black parent in this city if you didn't think that that could happen. So you have to imagine that that is your daily experience. That is what you are braced for. That is, that, that is one of the things that is in your list of what might be, that your kid might be summarily executed. Not necessarily by the police, it might be by another kid, but nonetheless. So when I asked the journalists who often wrote up these stories at the time, you know, did you, did you follow up or, you know, do you have any leads? And generally speaking, they would say, it just wasn't that exceptional that a child in that neighborhood and it would generally be poor black neighbors, that a child in that neighborhood would be shot. So what's really unsettling is that there are places in America where young people are not supposed to die. Movie theaters, schools, college campuses, and their deaths prompt great moral panic of little change. But then there are areas where they are expected to die. And they're passing prompts little more than a weary, familiar sigh beyond their communities. To exist as a working class African American is to be vulnerable. But to live in a poor black area simply renders you collateral. 
So each time these kids are shot by the police, we are told to wait until the facts come out before rushing to judgment. But as James Baldwin wrote when covering a trial in 82, to suspend judgment demands that one dismisses one's perceptions at the same moment that one is most crucially and cruelly dependent on them. Because the facts are out there. We know that a black person is killed every 28 hours by the police or someone working in security. We know that black kids are 21 times more likely to be shot by police than white kids. We know that police stopped and frisked more than 4 million people in New York in a decade, most of them black and Latino, and that according to their own figures, 90% of them were completely innocent. We know that at current rates, one in every three black boys born in 2000 will go to jail. We know that black youth don't use drugs at a greater rate than white youth, but are far more likely to be incarcerated for drug crimes. We know the black male life expectancy in Washington, D.C. is lower than male life expectancy on the Gaza Strip. We know the black infant mortality in Chicago is on a par with infant mortality on the West Bank. We know the black preschoolers, that's four-year-olds, are four times more likely to be suspended than white preschoolers. We know that there are more people in the U.S. penal system now than were imprisoned in the Soviet gulag at its height. We know that because felons lose the right to vote, there were more African-American men disenfranchised in 2004 than in 1870, the year the male franchise was secured. We know that there are more African-American men in prison or on probation or on parole in the US than there were enslaved in 1850. You already know enough wrote Sven Lindquist in Exterminate All the Brutes, and so do I. It's not knowledge we lack. What's missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions. And it's difficult not to come to the conclusion when we see what happened to Michael Brown in Ferguson and Eric Garner in Staten Island and Tamir Rice in Cleveland and Rhonda Rip Myers and Kajima Powell and Oscar Grant and Freddie Gray and Trayvon Martin and on and on. It's difficult not to know that this is not statistical aberration, but systemic abominations. A system cannot fail those it was never meant to protect, wrote Du Bois. That this is not a glitch in the matrix. This is the way the matrix was designed. So the grand jury deliberations and trials and convictions into these murders aren't just about the fate of a few police officers and a few dead black people. They're about the value of black life. They pass judgment on whether there's a price to pay for summarily removing people from the planet or whether it's a cost of doing business when one person has a badge and a gun and the other has too much melanin. Under slavery, an owner would have to be reimbursed for a slave who was deemed unreasonably slaughtered. Under Jim Crow, they would leave lynched bodies hanging to warn others of the price of transgression, real or imagined. And so when Michael Brown's body was left lying lifeless on the streets of Ferguson for four hours before the police collected it, it was an ugly metaphor for the contempt for black life in this post-civil rights, post-industrial moment, dispensable, despised, and discarded. Just take a step back for a moment and think through the hashtag Black Lives Matter, because you wouldn't have a hashtag that said black men play basketball or Black music matters, because only the most deluded would ever challenge that. But the reason Black Lives Matter has resonated so wildly is because it succinctly surmises where we are. We can celebrate a black president, black professors, black astrophysicists, black tennis players, all we want, but the issue of the sanctity of black life has not been settled. The red pill is a very bitter pill to swallow, and the rabbit hole is deep and dark. That these uprisings should have come in the midst of a slew of 50th anniversaries from the Civil Rights Movement, the Mississippi Freedom Summer, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, March on Washington, is sobering, particularly for those who still believe that America is a land of unrelenting progress. Just two years ago, while arguing the US Supreme Court uh, should dump key elements of the Civil Rights Act, Bert Rhine said of Southern racism, this is an old disease. There is an old disease, and that disease is cured. 
he won the case. The, uh, the Voting Rights Act was gutted. But those who go in search of this cure will find it quite elusive. The discrepancy between black and white unemployment is the same as it was 50 years ago. The discrepancy between black and white wealth is greater. The discrepancy between black and white incarceration is greater. Black children across the South now attend majority black schools at levels not seen in four decades. Now, this is not to say that we have literally reverted to a bygone era. As the proverb goes, no man ever steps in the same river twice because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. We have a black president, a black attorney general, and a black editor of the New York Times. There's a growing trend in interracial relationships. Suburbs are becoming more diverse. If the civil rights movement had been about getting black faces in new and high places, its work would now be done. But it wasn't. It was about equality. And the problem isn't that we have a great deal of progress to be made or that progress is too slow. It's that in some areas, America is, in fact, regressing and that there is no place in the myth for regression. Hence the title, Black Lives Matter in the Age of Obama, because on the night of the grand jury verdict, which decided that Darren Wilson didn't even have a case to answer. Now, I mean, it's worthwhile stopping and just dwelling on that. It's not that he went to trial and was found innocent. The, the grand jury decision w was that there should be no trial. There need be no trial for him shooting an unarmed black youth in the street. When the grand jury dis decided that he didn't have a case to answer, Obama did what presidents do in moments of strife. He came on television and declared, we are a nation based on the rule of law. So we need to accept that this was the special jury's decision to make. The sight on a split screen of the first black president appealing for calm on one side and alienated black youth looting and burning on the other lay bare the limits of what constitutes success in the post-civil rights era. What does it mean to say that everyone is equal regardless of race in a nation where economic and social inequalities are not just endemic but actively encouraged as part of the national myth about success? So these public executions of black civilians comes at a time when there is an unprecedented number of black elected officials, corporate executives, movie stars and athletes. Which means that for black America these are the Keynesian times. They're the best of times and the worst of times. Never have so many been doing so well, and never have so many been doing so badly. When Obama catapulted to national attention during the 2004 convention, he wrapped himself in the flag with the claim, for as long as I live, I will never forget that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. But it's no less true that in no other Western country would 205 black people have been shot dead already this year. In no other Western country would black America's poverty, poor health, poor housing and incarceration be possible. Indeed, the class and economic disparity is even more pronounced among African Americans than it is among whites. And with these levels of inequality within black America, a reckoning is order about what we mean by black power. Do you mean the broad uplift of a historically oppressed community or the elevation of a handful of prominent high-profile individuals? So long as the system of oppression remains intact, the identity of those administering it holds only symbolic relevance. In fact, having black people at the helm who don't change helps deflect accusations of racism. People become fixated on what organisations look like rather than what they actually do. As a result, the principle of fighting um, structural racism becomes eclipsed by a desire to look different and act the same. Those who start out campaigning for equal opportunities end up settling for photo opportunities. When I interviewed the black radical Angela Davis in 2007, she told me the Republican administration is the most diverse in history, but when the inclusion of black people into the machine of oppression is designed to make that machine work more efficiently, then it doesn't represent progress at all. We have more black people in more visible and powerful positions, but then we have far more black people who have been pushed down to the bottom of the ladder. When people call for diversity and link it to justice and equality, that's fine. But as a model of diversity is a difference that makes no difference and the change 
that brings no change. Obama has assist, insisted that the US is a nation of laws, and this is no doubt true. But without further clarification and qualification, it's also meaningless. Because the trouble is that the US, for far longer than it's been a nation of laws, has been a nation of injustice. And in the absence of basic justice, such laws can amount to little more than codified tyranny. It was no less a nation of laws when they jailed children as young as six in Birmingham, Alabama, or massacred Native Americans and stole their land. The question is whom these laws are supposed to serve and protect, by what means and to what end. The law, wrote James Baldwin, is meant to be my servant, not my master, still less my torturer and my murderer. And so the call for law and at certain points in times of revolt order has no meaning without an assessment of the order that prevailed. Those who call for law and order should understand that there is no order because men with badges have been acting lawlessly. What peace can there be when an 18-year-old can be shot dead while walking down the street with his hands up in a surrender position? What order are we to observe when a man selling cigarettes on the street can be strangled to death? The truth is that almost all the significant gains that black people have made towards full citizenship in America and indeed across the world have come not by observing the law, but by breaking it. And it's through that chasm between, sorry, that chasm between the official claim to an impartial legal system and the legacy of endemic racial justice that so many of these trigger-happy police officers make their escape with the flames of the ghetto in hot pursuit. For when so few policemen are indicted, let alone convicted of killing black people, they comprise not a special category, but a protected and elevated one. In this nation of laws, those charged with enforcing the law evidently operate above it, while the judiciary exists not to mediate between the police and the public, but to defend the police from the public. Once again, this is not a bump in the road. This is the road. So this isn't a morality play in which decent black people are slain by malicious white cops. The inherent nature of the injustice was not systematic, but systemic. If we are to believe the Department of Justice report into Ferguson, the entire system was corrupt, and somehow Darren Wilson came out unscathed. And this is why efforts to both defile the assailant's character and even defend the characters of the dead are so wrong-headed. The right concentrate on character defamation. If we look at Ferguson, they say Michael Brown was a thug because he allegedly stole cigarillos and therefore he deserved to die. Tamir Rice, who was 12, shouldn't have been playing with a gun in the park. Where were his parents? He was playing with a toy gun. And black people bought into this too. At Michael Brown's eulogy, Al Sharpton emphasized Blackness has never been about being a gangster or a thug. But here's the thing. Thugs have rights too. Thugs are human beings too. Thugs' lives matter. In this nation of laws, the penalty for stealing cigarillos is not summary execution. And those who don't understand that, but who claim to be on the side of justice, will forever be trying to justify why someone was not worthy of a bullet rather than protecting any person's right to walk the streets in safety. Were this an isolated episode, we could talk in terms of individuals, but it's not. They're structural. So the personalities are at best secondary, if relevant at all. And this is another thing that came up in the process of doing uh, my book. The number of times after a piece has been written about a kid who's died, that someone would make a comment underneath that suggested that somehow they were to blame. One of the boys uh, in Dallas, Samuel Bridman, had had an evening of uh, playing Uno, drinking cocoa. They watched We're the Millers with his friends. Then he decided to walk his uh, friend Denzel back to his grandmother's. It was about 11 o'clock at night, and Denzel lived five minutes away. So Samuel decided to walk him back, and while he was walking back, he was shot. We don't know who shot him. Samuel had barely lived there for six months and was a kind of uh, very uh, sweet, fragile kid. He, wasn't, he didn't know anybody there. 
Um, it may have been gang initiation, nobody knows. But the first comment after the story, which was only a paragraph long about his death, blamed Samuel's parents. Where were his parents? Why didn't they know when he was out? Why didn't they uh, do more um, uh, to look after their kids? Well, his mum knew exactly where he was. He was at the end of the road. She had been with him all evening. The trouble was that it wasn't that she didn't know where he was. It was that in that area, at that time, actually you can't protect your kids. It's not possible. You can't fight white supremacy by behaving better. Indeed, we know from movements past that it was when we filled the jails and took to the streets that things started moving. These young kids can pull their pants up all they like, and frankly, I wish they would, but they still would not be able to outrun a cop's bullet. Similarly, the police officers in question don't need to be evil. They just need to be operating in an institution where the chance that you will be sanctioned for killing a black youth is minimal and in a culture where armed white people can cite their fear of unarmed black people as a defense. A fear so intense that they have to shoot their kids. Have to, because apparently no other possible outcome was available. Such fears don't come from nowhere. To assume that when you see a black man, you see a criminal is rooted in the fact that black men have been systemically criminalized. So what now? What next? What we've seen so far over the last couple of years have been very popular mediated interventions and eruptions that have significantly gained global attention. But popularity isn't the same as efficacy. Black Lives Matter has found an audience, but yet to develop a program. And this is no, in no small part as much about the moment as about the movement. In the post-civil rights era, racism, much like neoliberal globalization, has become a force without a face. Black people can be whatever they want to be individually, so long as it's not equal collectively. You can have a black president so long as he doesn't stand too openly and too closely alongside black people. We can revel in him singing Amazing Grace so long as he's ditched his radical black preacher and is singing at a funeral. And this is why comparisons between this moment and the civil rights era fall short, because back then there were clear targets. When they marched over Edmund Peters Bridge in 65 in Selma, they were marching for the vote. When they went on the Freedom Rides in 61, they were trying to integrate interstate travel. When they marched in Birmingham in 63, they were opposing segregation. Today, the signs are down. The abstract rights exist. The physical barriers are gone. And yet, equality has not arrived. African Americans have the right to eat in any institution that they please, but they don't yet have the means to pay the bill. Racism is so utterly embedded in the institutions from the courthouse to the schoolhouse that to unpick one part is to make the whole thing unravel. So literally, where would one march? To the jail, to the police stations, to the courts, to the governor's mansion? And when you get there, what would you demand? An end to racism? What would that even look like? Police cameras? How much good did that do, Eric Garner? These are problems to which we don't have the answers. What's encouraging is that I think black America is asking the right questions. At least for now we are mobilized and even if we don't exactly know where we're going, we are on the move. The blue pill is a sedative. It puts you to sleep, believing a cure is around the corner, only to wake up and find that nothing has changed. The red pill offers some clarity, but no cure. It shows you how deep the rabbit hole goes, but it cannot show you how to get out. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gary. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, now we'll have um, questions. Um, as was said at the beginning, there are guys going up and down the aisles. So if you just identify yourself before you ask the question and wait for the, the mic to, uh, to arrive. 
So anyone want to ask Gary a question? Hi, Gary. My, my name's Danny. Thank you so much for your perspective today. This was, this was really fascinating. We appreciate you being here. Um, I was wondering, I, I'm aware you're not American, but I was wondering how you felt about this uh, American movement being um, mobilised to protest, uh, for example, racist police actions outside of the US. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the, the racist murder by police of Checo Bayo in my own hometown in Glasgow, um, which I'm sure you've heard of. How do you feel about Black Lives Matter as a movement being used um, to mobilise people against racism in countries where the police don't carry guns? I mean, I, I think it, in the same way that um, the civil rights movement in the 60s spoke to the diaspora in a very clear way because... Um, it was a period of anti-colonial struggle around the world, and so everyone was having the same conversation. Um, and therefore you could, while each country was different, you could um, intersperse King with uh, Kawanda or um, uh, Nkrumah or whoever, there was a, there was a collective conversation that was taking place around the world, which was how do black people reach full citizenship, um, formal citizenship. And so similarly, I think, in the Western world, there is one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter translates is because in different ways, throughout the Western world, people are asking the same question uh, or similar questions, which is, I guess, we have formal citizenship, but we don't have equality. So how do we translate this formal citizenship into equality? And so to that extent, the situation is very similar. You can see what happened with Trayvon Martin. And if you're um, in London or Glasgow or Stockholm or Paris, it, you can, you know, it, it doesn't take an awful lot of translation. Um, the problem would be if one ceased to think that it needed any translation because the situations are different. They're not less or more, but they are uh, very different for the simple reason that the scale on which African Americans are being slaughtered is just so much higher. Um, but then there are, there are more ways to deprive people of um, equality than just killing them. So, you know, if you roll in, say, in a British context, the way the mental health institutions work uh, or don't work for uh, uh, black people and the, um, the way that the education system does or doesn't work, um, and actually to some degree the way that uh, incarceration doesn't work, then you have, a similar, you have a similar conversation. So I think that the conversations are, are analogous um, and the possibilities for solidarity are kind of quite clear. Um, it always makes me nervous when uh, um, I hear British people saying, for example, it's exactly the same thing here. And I you know, want to say, it's not, it's not exactly the same thing here. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that it's not bad, and it doesn't mean that America's worse, but it's not the same thing here, you know. Um, it's, it, they're, they're very different countries, and the levels of inequality are different. The, um, um, the one thing I would say about American racism in general, this is America in general, not actually just this racism, America is more lethal. So anything that you have anywhere else, it can be more lethal in America. So if you're poor, you're more likely to die because you won't have health care. Um, um, everything goes worse with guns. And when you have guns at the rate that America has, then 
once again, everything is is um, uh, is more lethal. If you are wrongly convicted with the incarceration rates, then they also have capital punishment. So ev everything can, pretty much everything can kill you pretty quickly, <laughs> and that is um, <coughs> paradigmatically different to Europe. Any other questions? Just a couple. We'll take Barry first, the, the guy further back, and then yourself after. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Um, I had an experience last year um, that I'd be interested in hearing you comment on. We, we were visiting um, Memphis, and we went to the Civil Rights Museum there, mm. which was... Uh, one of the best museum experiences that I've had, apart from the typical ending uh, with the gift shop, which yeah. is pretty much standard, apart from the wee labels changed anywhere in the world. But this was a beautifully designed and very cleverly designed experience mm. uh, as a multimedia event and as one that perfectly encapsulated the black rights struggle and the history and the personalities behind it. Um, the only problem I had, and I came away trying to reconcile my conflicting thoughts on this, and it was that it began with probably about a 25-minute film uh, encapsulating the history of the struggle and the movement right up to the contemporary situation. And that was followed by a very brief word from our sponsors, who happened to be mm. Ford Motors. Yeah. And there was a very handsome looking avuncular white gentleman in a suit announcing with certain modest pride, if that's possible, uh, a feeling of how, how, how benefit this experience would be and, and how happy the corporation was uh, for its participation and ability to support this. And in the light of what you said tonight, I'm wondering, where do you go uh, to, to, to have a channel or to find a medium for this kind of purity of expression, for this kind of frustration at its worst, that isn't already a part of a system that effectively could be run by Ford Motors? Um, I, and it's the old question, that Terry Eagleton talking about ideology and how is there an outside of ideology asks, can can we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps? But where is the outside that isn't already neatly nestled in the Ford Motors system, without sounding too paranoid? But there, I can understand a frustration there, but, but, but how does that happen so that a black man on the screen isn't just a white man with a black face, as you've said, paraphrasing you badly? Um, if that's not too negative, uh, or a desperate uh, an idea. I'd love to hear your, your feelings mean, on that. It's, it's capitalism, so it will, you know, it will buy it. It will buy your struggle, sell it back to you for double, and you know, in the meantime, have extracted all meaning from it. I actually, happen to know a little bit about what happened in Memphis, and that that there is actually a struggle in the local community there about resting. Resting control of the Civil Rights Museum because the history of a lot of these museums is that actually when they wanted to put them up initially there was a major fight because the you know local uh, uh, worthies couldn't see any tourist potential in it and um, d didn't want to sully the name with you know this um, uh, you know, besmirched the good name of Memphis by talking too much about um, civil rights. So these things were generally, you know, the load was carried by kind of activists in the same way that Martin Luther King Day was. Um, and then, um, and then appropriated once it, you know, was seen as as being successful. I guess I feel that this that these. Things like that are inevitable. They're not, which doesn't mean that one doesn't fight them, but that there are always these things going on on the periphery 
that kind of over, over, overtake them. So um, I don't know how Memphis would have co covered the Black Lives Matter thing before the guy at Ford comes in. But there will come a moment where you can't have a film that doesn't take in Black Lives Matter and Ford doesn't want to be related to Black Lives Matter and so they either split or the museum actually becomes a place where you don't want to go because it's so hopelessly sanitised that, um, uh, that it's lost all relevance. And I know from the research I did in the Martin Luther King story and the speech in particular, the I Have a Dream speech, that these things are never settled. The legacies of these things are never settled. They're, all, they're constantly being negotiated and renegotiated in ways that also force the appropriators to make compromises, actually. So when King died, I think two years before he died, two thirds of Americans had a disapproving, you know, dis disapproved of him. By 1999, when Americans were asked, who do you most admire in the last century? He came second to Mother Teresa. And what happened in between was not just that he was co-opted. It wasn't just that people who we don't like decided that they would get rid of all memory of him opposing the Vietnam War, calling America the most violent military you know, uh, country in the world, uh, calling for some form of socialism and redistribution of wealth, and just remember him as the man who wanted his kids to play with white kids. But also that, um, that those, so it wasn't just that they won, it was also a huge amount of struggle to get his birthday as a national holiday, and uh, a concerted attempt to force America to remember him somehow. And then that memory is constantly in flux. So the Black Lives Matter movement has been reclaiming King. It's been quite interesting how little of Malcolm X you've heard about in this moment. But what they've been doing is reclaiming the much more militant King that was lost. And depending on how they do that and how that ends up, then all of the people who have decided to appropriate King and you know put him on their mastheads or whatever are then going to have to you know work out whether they still want to do that. So I, I guess all, all I'm saying is that I don't think these things are only one way, and I think that so long as capitalism is a system that we're living in, that it's going to be unavoidable that a certain kind of um, political mission will be appropriated or will, they will attempt to appropriate it. And outside of that, which is a question you ask, you know, how do we get stuff outside, that there will always be stuff going on outside of that, that there always will be. Uh, and there's nothing that they won't appropriate. If they could appropriate Malcolm X, they would. You know, so there's nothing that they won't do. But that them doing it doesn't stop us doing other things. So Black Lives Matter is still continuing. And, and you see I don't know, the, the shots in Chicago of people facing down cops and of, um, uh, of you know, young people. They closed Michigan Avenue, which is a main drag in Chicago. Uh, during one of the biggest uh, uh, shopping days and and so so there is a limit to how successful that is actually going to be because people got to live people have to be able to walk the streets they have to be able to eat and so that it they don't actually they appropriate the memory of those struggles but they don't actually appropriate the struggles themselves I don't think and uh, and that's what's going on out, out, outside of it it's always sickening to see, it's also weirdly intriguing because you have to keep remembering how far Ford would have wanted to have been from Martin Luther King at a certain time.
And so they are indicators of actually how, to, a, to some extent, of how much we have achieved. Not that that's what we wanted to achieve, but that they now want to be associated with us in a way that you know, wouldn't have been um, uh, true before. And finally, I think these things... I think of Beyonce when you, you know, when you talked about that and the, the extent to which, you know, her uh, Super Bowl performance and the video that she did. And, um, you know, I don't, I'm not looking to Beyonce for political direction, frankly. And um, I, um, but she wouldn't go there if she didn't think there was an audience. And if she didn't, if she thought it would ruin her career, she wouldn't do it. And so the fact that, so there is this kind of symbiotic relationship whereby, of course, she's taking some stuff and she's appropriating it. Bit, I've never seen her on a demonstration. I've never seen her kind of speak out until, you know, it was kind of fairly useless to speak out on the one hand. On the other hand, she wants to be associated with us. She sees a value in what we're doing. And she has not, she's made the calculation that this will not hurt her career. This will actually be good for her. And that actually speaks to a level of cultural strength that we have. Um, so I choose. Not to have a glass half empty. If Ford is sponsoring, you know, this is brought to you, but that's not good. Um, uh, so it's not that my glass is half full, but I, I, I don't think that that only signifies bad things. I actually think in some ways it speaks to what the degree to which we have some kind of hegemonic role in this and that we are dragging things in the other direction. There was another that guy, and then yourself, just up here. I'm reminded of Raoul Van Egan. We were talking about him mm. earlier. He said, recuperation is always a two-way street. And I think that's, that's true. Hi, Gary. Um, you actually mostly covered this in your previous uh, answer, but um, when you talked about the misappropriation of Martin Luther King's ideas, I was wondering if... Um, since you mentioned that BLM don't have a coherent program, if you thought it would be useful for them to take up a sort of a more working class based program, sort of in line with the later ideas of Martin Luther King, of Hugh Newton and Angela Davis, as you mentioned, if they could advocate a break with capitalism? Um, I mean, they could. I mean, it would, you know, it would be good to hear them have a critique of capitalism I don't think that, um, I think that to try and understand race and class separately is to misunderstand them both completely. And that they, while they operate together, they don't, they're not the same thing. And that um, uh, it's difficult to see what a, in huge sections of America, what a working class program would look like when um, in some areas race looks like class. That the white people have taken all their kids out and put them in segregated academies where um, the levels of segregation in some areas is so huge that um, it, you would end up, it would, it would nonetheless end up being black people that you're talking about anyway. And that um, th there is, and one can see this in the rise of Trump and who is supporting Trump, which is the white working class. And they're not only supporting Trump, they're also supporting Bernie Sanders. But that um, uh, identity in these moments is not simply about how people feel about being different. It actually has a material consequence on their lives. 
and which is why you can't talk about that separately from talking about uh, talking about race, uh, t um, uh, about talking about class. And so I'm not sure what, given America's history of racism, very recent history of codified racism, I don't know what that working class program looks like. Um, because uh, America's working class has been organized in a way to make such class organization virtually impossible in this moment. And that um, to expend your efforts trying to convince um, sections of the white working class that you're worthy of life, that everything that they've been taught, everything that they see on the channels that they watch is not true. There's only so many hours in the day, I'm not sure that I would use my hours to, you know, for that in particular. Which doesn't mean that there aren't, in certain moments, at certain times, with certain kinds of leadership, that there aren't possibilities. I remember Jesse Jackson winning over large numbers of uh, white working class people in his line, you know, yeah. when the lights go out, when the factory closes and the lights go out, we're all the same color in the dark. Yeah. There, are, there are appeals that you can make, yeah. but I don't know that there is an appeal that you can make that negates American racism. Let's forget all that stuff. We're all poor. Let's get together. I don't know that, I, I haven't seen much evidence of that working as a program in, in, in uh, recent times. And if you look at states like Kentucky and West Virginia, West Virginia being after Mississippi, I think the poorest state, uh, which is solid Republican, solid Republican state, Mississippi, also solid Republican states. Actually, most of the poorest states are solid Republican states, yeah. which suggests that the appeals to class have to come with something else. Thank you. Thank you. Just before you, you come in, I mean, do you think that that kind of relationship between race and class helps to explain something like Bernie Sanders' numbers around African Americans and and his lack of popularity there because he's spinning always away from an identity politics and he's spinning to a kind of economic explanation of the problem. So it's always about the bankers, as it were. Whereas the Clintons have cultivated a long relationship with the African American community. Is that does that cash out in, in that way that I've described? Do you think? Or? I mean, s somewhat. I think that. Um, uh, Bernie Sanders, it's, the problem isn't that he speaks the language of class. Mm. The problem is that he has not found a way to speak the language of race. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he's, he's from the whitest state in the country. Yeah. Um, it's not a language that he is particularly familiar with. Mm. And it happens to emerge <laughs> at a time of heightened racial consciousness. Yeah. So um, he just hasn't been able, in the way that he has successfully articulated the frustrations that people have mm -hmm. with the um, economic system, the fact that the bankers have not been jailed, the fact that um, wages are stagnant, yeah. um, living standards are falling, mm the fragility of the middle class. Mm. He's been able to articulate that frustration. Yes. He has not been able to articulate the frustration of those parents that I referred to yeah. who fear that their kids might get shot dead. Yes. And um, it's not really that Clinton has done a great job at doing that either, mm. but um, there are a few things. I think African-Americans, they know Bill Clinton f from years gone by. Mm -hmm. Um, they, um, he has been able to leverage over the years his relationships with black clergymen, mm. 
uh, black politicians and so on. And I also think African Americans as a voting bloc are risk averse, mm. which is different from being conservative. Yes. But that when Obama came on the scene, they would not, they did not support him until he won Iowa. Mm. And then if you look at the numbers in South Carolina, as soon as he won Iowa, and then African Americans were like, okay, if white people are gonna support him, if this is actually gonna be a real thing, then we're in. Mm. But we're not supporting any symbolic candidacies because uh, we don't want another, we've had eight years of Bush, we don't want yeah. four years of McCain and Palin, we do, you know. And so they are, they are risk averse and they don't see Bernie Sanders as a, mm. as secure a bet mm. as yeah. they do Clinton. Yes, indeed. Okay. Just here, you had a question? Yeah, well, actually, if you just take the mic, thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, actually, that was my question. <laughs> was about, his, about uh, Bernie Sanders and, and Clinton. But um, I just wanted to let me just elaborate on it slightly. That um, to go back to something that you said, Gary, where uh, Black Lives Matter have managed to capture a mood and an audience, but have not yet got a program. Um, and if it's to have real historical significance, it will take time for that to evolve, but right now, there are immediate strategic choices. And I know that, um, you know, in its early encounters with um, progressive politics, for want of a better term, at, like at Phoenix, Arizona, at the activist convention, when the Black Lives Matter people presented themselves uh, and got the response, all lives matter, that was a rebuff, mm. that was a negation of their campaign. And they left the hall feeling extremely um, depressed by, by the experience. Um, nonetheless, strategic choices have to be made. And am I taking it to understand from what you said that um, in a way this is a sort of settled debate inside Black Lives Matter that given the risks that come with the Republican candidates that uh, Bernie Sanders is just too much of a risk and too much outside the culture and that Clinton is actually now the candidate? Oh, uh, no, no, because um, that assumes Black Lives Matter has a far... Black Lives Matter is a little bit like the Tea Party, insofar as it exists far more readily as a notion than it does as anything solid. So Black Lives Matter couldn't actually decide anything. I mean, it's not yet that solid... Uh, uh, um, um, a movement is it was, when I talked about it being a kind of mediated eruptions. I mean, it's a it's a hashtag and an aspiration and an episodic collection, um, but it's um, but it's not yet what we would have recognised. Mm in the past as being a movement. Um, actually, I think in, in that sense, it's a very modern movement. It's a lot like Occupy Wall Street, which, you know, if you'd said, you know, well, who's Occupy Wall Street gonna support in the election? It's like, well, it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. And um, um, so I think quite sensibly, the people who are m most likely to be taken as spokespeople for Black Lives Matter, and that they don't really have spokespeople, um, haven't really oriented towards any candidate, which I think is smart, actually. Let, let this happen. I don't think that kind of... Um, if it were a more coherent and cohesive force, I don't think it would make sense to throw your lot in behind Bernie Sanders or, or anybody else because they're far more powerful actually staying outside of that polity. I mean, it has... Bernie Sanders' ascent has kind of made me... Uh, not revisit in terms of um, reassess, but kind of 
trying to trace that back. It's difficult not to trace it back to Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. And the degree to which at the time people were saying, well, they've got no program, what is this? You know, all the jazz hands, this isn't going anywhere. You know, why aren't you electing people? There was a whole thing from the kind of moderate liberals about why this was a kind of waste of time and why having riled up all this energy, you know, what they were going to do with it. When actually what we're seeing with Bernie Sanders is that none of this energy is ever lost and that having injected a meme, <coughs> the 99%, 1% meme, they've kind of, you know, attached themselves, not formally, but to a candidate and that there are... Um, that it's had a life beyond itself. And it hasn't been a formal progression where you could say, you see how good Occupy Wall Street is? First he did this, and then he did this, and then he did that. But it would be very odd not to see a link. And in that same way, you know, I think that... And so they were, it was good that Occupy Wall Street didn't attach itself to Obama or attack Obama or kind of really get involved in any of that, really. I mean, it's not like there was any lack of programs out there for talking about redistribution of wealth. And whatever this moneyed show they called democracy was going to do, it was going to do. It was going to do it with them or without them. Um, and they found another way in. And I, I hope that Black Lives Matter does, you know, to the extent that it exists in the same way as a mood and an aspiration. Uh, I hope that it takes a similar route, which is a, uh, not non-partisan, because they're not going to be Republicans, are they? But that is, um, uh, sees itself as having a purpose higher than what American politics, awash with money, gerrymandered up the weather, beyond what American politics can actually offer, that is, its mandate and its mission is, a, is of a higher purpose and of a more serious purpose that is going to be encapsulated in an, in an election, I think. There's a question just up there, if you take the mic up. I mean, maybe there's just before... Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the question... Uh, that you raise I think is quite interesting because I think, you know, dare I say it, we get to a certain age and our understanding of what politics is and what political movements are are very much coloured by our own historical situation. So working class politics, say, for me, <coughs> is about the trade union movement. But what if you're in a situation where a lot of working class people don't have mm. jobs, never mind being part of a, of a trade union? So we don't recognise the movement as a political movement, but that's only a lack of kind mm. of historical imagination on our part. So why should a, a political movement have an organised party? Yeah. For instance. Yeah. You know. Um, so it's just a sign we're getting old, I think. <laughs> well, and that kind of um, nobody knows what these things are yet. Exactly. Including arguably the people yeah. in them. Yeah. But they are something. Yeah. And they do something. And that when these moments happen, a kid gets shot, they have, they have a way of finding each other and of organising together. And that, to me, is enough to call it a movement. But modern movements, I think partly because of the way new technology you know, can organise people, they burn brightly. They fade, they burn brightly again, they fade. They are geographically kind of promiscuous. Mm. Um, um, they don't need leadership models mm. in order to continue, although they might need them in order to thrive. Yeah. And the truth is, I, I, I don't really know, because I, I mean, I don't think anybody knows, because this stuff is kind of quite new. What's quite important, I think, for those of us on an older level is not to dismiss them because they're not what we recognise, but yeah. to actually be trying to un un understand them. But they're tricky to understand because they're shape-shifting. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Oh, well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating and very thought-provoking talk. Um, my question really is to do with um, picking up on, on, on themes that you, you've brought up, uh, is that one of the, looking to the future, one of the major changes in America is going to be demographic, so that we're looking at a society that will no longer be uh, predominantly white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, mm. um, and that it will be a multi, much more of a multiracial society in which whites will be a minority, uh, which, which, which begs the question about well, uh, what will happen to white supremacy. But you, you seem to have been suggesting um, that, that it doesn't really matter what colour the people are because racism is so deeply embedded in the culture and in, in the systems. And then just picking up on what you were saying about race and class um, and, and the, the complexity of that, I, I'm wondering, I'm thinking about Malcolm X and his, his view of immigrants, that they'll become American once they learn in opposition to black Americans and mm. you know, using, using the N-word. Um, which suggest, suggested that, and you, and you said yourself, you know, the worst of times, the best of times, uh, that we see blacks in very high positions, but we also see them worse off than they've, they've ever been. Um, so is, is the, and then you brought in capitalism, so is, is, the, is the problem that we have an underclass of blacks that are seen as a dangerous class, that are a rebuke to capitalism, and that almost everybody, incl including middle class and well-off blacks, can despise? Um, in terms of the, the the first bit of your question about the um, yeah, I do think I think white supremacy can easily survive when whites are a minority. I mean, look at South yeah. Africa. Yeah. You know, I, I um, uh, you just have to ramp up the machinery of oppression, really. Um, but I think it's in the demographic shift, it's because of the demographic shift that you're seeing things like Donald Trump and Sarah Palin come to the fore. So there is, this is a feverish, this is a last hurrah of a certain kind of electoral politics because it has a limited appeal. That I think it was Lindsey Graham the South Carolina senator, Republican senator, who said, we're not producing enough angry white guys to stay in business. <laughs> and, um, and so there is a... It's why they've gone from the dog whistle politics to just wolf whistle politics, because to hell with the code. We need, you know, the only way that they can win with the kind of politics that they're suggesting is to pull out as many white people as they possibly can. Yeah. And so this is, I think, the beginning of, they talk about alcoholics re reaching rock bottom. I think this is the beginning of the Republicans breaking the fever in terms of the Nixon strategy. So the Nixon strategy after the 60s was a racially motivated strategy for a certain kind of electoral majority that involved white suburban and rural people in the north and the former Dixiecrats in the south. That's what the Republicans have been working on since 64. That's Willie Horton, that's been, you know, every coded message they've done. The numbers have changed in a way that means that that doesn't work anymore. And this is the, I think, each time you think you can get more crazy, you think, well, Palin, okay, they've got, you know, they've hit, they've hit crazy, and then they get more crazy. Um, this feels to me like the bottom in terms of a realignment that they are going to have to make in order to <coughs> remain relevant. Because business, big business, still wants its work done in Congress, and. They can get quite a lot done through the Democrats, but they can get so much more done if, you know, if they've bought both parties. And so um, uh, I expect that white supremacy will become more sophisticated because it doesn't, the point of white supremacy isn't ultimately, I think, the point of it isn't to ensure that all white people have a really good life. I mean, in, you know, in South Africa, they were always really, really poor 
white people. It's a version of a capitalist system that works, can work quite well in the neoliberal order. And so um, I don't, it becomes more of a challenge as the numbers of white people go down, but it doesn't become uh, impossible. The second point that you were making about um, the, the black underclass and its relationship in a way to um, uh, the black middle class and the degree to which nobody wants anything to do with them, you know, including uh, um, other African Americans. There is just, um, well, I guess two things. So, <coughs> since the end of the, since civil rights, formal civil rights were achieved, there has always been this concern because before then, everybody had to live together. The, the you know, the um, in the South anyway, the the postman and the ditch digger and the doctor had to live in the same area. That's what segregation did, and therefore there was a limit to how far you could distance yourself from the more impoverished elements. In the North, meanwhile, they constantly, there was a constant attempt to impose a class structure within black America. I mean, there was class differentials, but to actually impose a, you live here, you live here, we'll go to this school, you'll go to that school. But it just crashed on the rocks of racism. And in a way, it speaks in part to the, how complicated these relationships are between race and class. So there's only so, the one thing that wealth won't make you is white. And that that comes with some challenges that, um, if you're going to, you could move to an area where there were no other black people, take your kid, make sure your kid didn't go to a school where there were other black people, make sure your kid didn't dress like black people, make sure your kid didn't go out too late. But th these are the kind of policing you would have to do in order to think that your child would be safe. And so all of these uh, eruptions that take place, Michael Brown being an example, they kind of, they send a shiver through the whole black community. It doesn't really matter how, um, these parents that I spoke to who were working class and black who thought that their kids might be killed, well, I don't know that if you go to the wealthier part of town that there isn't also a fear in there in a way that that would that would not be true for um, would not be true for white people. Now there is always an attempt to make this distinction. It just never really works. So um, I remember when Henry Louis Gates Jr. was arrested getting into his house. Henry Louis Gates Jr. is a professor at Harvard. And the uproar was, look what they've done to a Harvard professor. <laughs> look what they've done. And so the sense was, I can't believe, not I can't believe that they would do this to somebody, but that I can't believe that they're treating him like black people. There are some people who you could understand why they would do that, but why would they do it to him? And so, the, the, and in there, there is a sense that black people could earn their way, educate their way, class their way out of racism. But they keep coming back to deal with the reality, which is that, well, what are you going to do with this class? You're going to buy a big car? Well, good luck driving that around and not getting stopped. You gonna send your kid to a, 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 a fancy school? Well, good luck expecting that your kid will have the same treatment as the other kids in the school. Um, if you're gonna live in a white area, 
good luck. You know, going for a jog at night and not thinking that people are, you know, that you're running away. Or you can live in a black area. And if you can live in a black area, then you're not escaping from black life and your area will be policed in a way that is policed. So there isn't really... Much as they try, and I have some relationship to this just through family, much as they try, there is a limit to how far you can escape racism through class. That doesn't mean that your race experience, if you're upper class, is going to be the same as if you're poor. It's not. But um, you, you're never going to earn your way out of it. I haven't seen that happen. I've seen people try the bejesus out of it, but I've never seen it achieved. And if you think of in a previous life before we knew all of his um, uh, sexual degradations, Bill Cosby. On the one hand, he's lecturing black parents about how to raise their kids and all, all the rest of it. His kid got killed. Um, Bobby Rush, the um, guy who Obama ran against uh, in Chicago, his kid got killed. There is not, there is no way to hermetically seal yourself in America from racism. Class just won't do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other? We may have time for maybe one more question. Anyone? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, hopefully my question will perhaps lead us back to our little place called Northern Ireland. Um, could you say something about the politics of gun control among the black community? Um, I, I remember Cerebus, the big private equity company in New York, um, got out of financing the gun control industry after they set up the Freedom Company. Um, but that wasn't because of the huge amounts of deaths of black people. It was one of the school shootings. Mm. Um, that money, of course, has a story to tell here because we have a scandal called the Nama scandal and I believe it was all that money which was then used after having sold up the Freedom Company to invest in property in Belfast. But that's another story. But perhaps you could say something about the politics of gun control within the um, black community. Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a very good question because it's... Um, uh, here's what I found doing this book was that if you ask people, why do you think this happens? An open question. What do you think is going on here? You know, I would say to them, every single parent I met, I would say that I live in England and this doesn't happen in England. What do you, what do you think is happening? Almost to a person, as though reciting a script, African Americans would talk about parenting and families and... Uh, church or whatever, nobody mentioned guns. Not a single person, African American, Latino or white, nobody mentions guns. Because it's like if your kid got run over saying, I want to stop all traffic. Mm -hmm. You can't imagine there being no traffic. It's bad luck that your kid got run over. Maybe you're going to campaign for a 20 mile an hour sign or something like that. But we can't imagine a life without traffic. Well, Try imagining life, you African American, without poverty or racism or guns. It's just they're everywhere, and so they concentrate on what they can, you know, what they can control. Um, but what I saw in one of the kids was killed in Indianapolis, and the NRA convention was held there the next, you know, four months later. So I went to the NRA convention, <laughs> and. Um, uh, the Every Town for Gun Safety was there, which is the thing that Bloomberg set up with millions and millions of dollars. And the truth is that there is a way of talking about gun control that is actually, that says, I am terrified of these black people. You know, there is a way of talking about gun control which is very, very white and which is about preserving the... Um, the safety of the suburbs and of saying that, um, of, of, of keeping guns out of the role. And so people talk about thugs 
and thug life and so on. And so you, you get very, very few, even though African Americans are the most likely to be affected by stray guns, very few of them are involved in this movement. And the, usually the way they get involved in it is that their kids die and then they're, they're put on the podium. But actually in the movement itself, it's very much about, um, uh, say, after Sandy Hook, you know, people talk in terms of angels and innocence and this notion that uh, of, uh, of a defiled kind of purity. And so the African-American parent whose kid may have a drug conviction or who, um, uh, whose kid may have a child out of wedlock or whatever it is, doesn't feel that they can be a part of that. So the very areas where the gun control movement needs to be in order to be effective, it can't be because the kind of message that it sends is one of keeping the ghetto away. Do you know what I mean? Of, of keeping the chaos at bay. And to me, what that speaks to is the problem of speaking about gun control in isolation from other things. So of course, a country with the number of guns that America has is gonna have a problem. But that, what you also see is, if you have those levels of segregation and inequality and um, desperation, then you take away healthcare, which means people with mental health issues, the primary provider of mental health care in America is the prisons. Mm. So then you have no care for mental health. And then you put guns on top of that. That, of course, it's the gun that makes it lethal. But you, to talk about gun control independently of these other things, is a very kind of um, uh, tricky proposition. And, um, and, but that's what they're trying to do. And so you end up really just talking about security and it becomes like a huge kind of neighborhood watchy kind of thing that large numbers of people that don't trust the state to protect them and do live in very insecure areas feel like, well, I'm not sure that this is for me, and it doesn't look like you really want me. So the gun, I think that the problem that the gun control movement has had is that it has not been able to make connections with the people who most desperately need gun control, and who, by all polling suggests, are the most likely to be in favor of gun control, which is poor African-American and Latino uh, communities. They've just failed to make that uh, connection and so it ends up being a movement at the moment of overwhelmingly middle class white uh, women who talk about mama bears and protecting their cubs and um, the uh, innocence of babes. I mean, literally, innocence of babes and who are galvanized not by the 17 year old who's out with his friends and gets shot or the Samuel Brightman walking down the road because there's an assumption about who they are, but it's galvanized by the mass shootings of people who were shot where they're not supposed to be. And, um, and that's a tragedy for the gun control movement, really, because I don't think it can really, it's one of the few areas where Obama has really done his best um, having not said anything for the first four years. Um, so when Aurora happened, he did what all presidents do. Now's not a time for politics, let's pray. But that's before 2012 election. Yeah. But then Sandy Hook happens afterwards and he comes out and he really um, <coughs> grabs onto the third rail with both hands and says, we have to talk about this. And has kept on doing that yeah. to his credit. But um, in terms of a social movement, it's difficult to see how those two forces can be 
cohered. And an example of that would be that most of this money for the uh, uh, every town for gun safety comes from Michael Bloomberg. Yeah. He's bankrolled it to the tune of several million. Bloomberg is the person who, to his last days, defended stop and search in New York, which overwhelmingly terrorised African American and Latino communities. Because to Bloomberg, and I think to a lot of these <coughs> women, gun control and stop and search both relate to the same thing, which is security. And on any kind of security question, African Americans <laughs> are, 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 are rightly going to feel a little bit suspicious yeah. and, um, uh, and, and wary, and I, I wouldn't blame them. Okay. Um, <coughs> thanks very much, Gary. I, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone when I say that that was a really, really fascinating and stimulating uh, discussion. Um, thanks for coming along. Thank you. Okay.